Okay, in this video, we're going to set up an Excel kind of like automatic calculator for um, running one sample proportion uh, hypothesis test, right? So basically you have a question that says, hey, we think this population of things has a proportion of 11%. Here's your sample and it had this many successes out of this size sample. In the case that I'm using, we had 21 successes out of a sample size of 160. Let's test it. Let's find the, you know, the Z stat, and then let's figure out the, the p-value, right? So we can either uh, reject or fail to reject the, the null hypothesis that the population proportion is 11%. Now, I have this Excel file saved. Um, and the link is in the, the notes for this video, so you can download um, this uh, template, and then you'll just can work along with the video and put in the formulas as we discuss them. Everything in yellow is stuff that you manually have to change every time you are uh, basically attempting to do a new question, because every question that you're ever going to see that's asking you to run a hypothesis test on a one sample proportion is always going to give you three things. It's going to give you the proposed proportion from the population, i.e. the P, right, the population proportion that you're kind of testing against. And then it's going to tell you that you took a sample of a certain size and it had so many successes. Or sometimes it'll just tell you uh, your sample size and then um, the, the, the P hat, the, the proportion of your sample that was a success. And then you just treat that a little differently. But in any case, this is normally what you're given. Now, this um, cell I already have formatted in the template um, as a percentage, as you can see up here. So that way you don't have to worry about, oh, if it's 13%, I got to type in 0.13, right, as a decimal, because you do have to use the decimals when you do the formulas. But the nice thing about Excel is this is just a skin. This The cell itself is containing the value 0.11, so we can use it in all of our formulas. It's just put the bow on the package and said, I'm going to present it to you as 11%, the viewer. So that's the nice thing. We don't have to you know, worry about anything like that. Okay, the first thing we're going to need, um, as you can see down here in our formula, is we have to take uh, P0 and multiply it by its complement, 1 minus P0. Now, P sub 0 is math speak for the null hypothesis P. It's the value that we're testing against. That's usually what we call the population proportion. So this is the same thing as P0. I'm just calling it P because it's it's kind of a pain to try and put a sub-zero in Excel. It's not the hardest thing in the world. I just didn't want to waste a lot of time doing it, right? So like, I, for instance, if you want to do it, you can put a zero here. Then you have to highlight the zero. You have to go up here to font. And then down here to subscript and hit OK. And now you'll see that it's P sub zero. Okay, so it can be done, but it's just it's time consuming and not worth it. Anyhow, we know this is the complement of P, so we can literally just type this as equals one minus this cell. And then that's always going to create the complement of P. You can see the complement of 11% is 89%. Okay, P hat, right? The formula for P hat is just number of successes divided by sample size. So that's going to equal our number of successes divided by our sample size. And that's going to be our p hat. Now let's say they gave you p hat and they gave you a sample size, right? So they told you, um, you know, that it was 13% and you had a, a sample of 160. Well, you're fine then. You don't, you can just use that 13%. You could type the 13% in here and then you would just have to go back and, you know, like uh, redo the formula later. Or you could take the 13% and multiply it by 160, right? Because if you had a 13% uh, success rate in your calculator, you could literally just do 160 times 0.13. And then whatever that number is, round it and then put that number in here for K, and then it will create the 13% here, and then you don't have to worry about 
redoing the formula later. So just in case you come across that type of question, you can always attack it that way. Okay, now we move on to the Z-stat, and all we're going to do is we're going to recreate this formula. Now, a lot of times students have problems typing these formulas into Excel as one big long string because they're not sure where to put parentheses to make sure the order of operations are running correctly and all that kind of stuff. So if you find yourself having difficulties with that, then what I say is um, do it in pieces and put those pieces in other cells and then it can refer to those pieces. So for instance, down here, I can say this is going to be uh, p hat minus p0. And then this is simply just going to equal my p hat cell minus my p0 cell. And so now that's the number that goes up here. Now down here, I need p0 times right q0 and then divide the whole thing by n. And, and that's easy. We don't have to worry about any kind of order of operations uh, with that because it's just multiplication and division. So I don't know what you want to call that, the, the P0 you know, times Q0 divided by N piece. So that's going to equal my P0 times, right, uh, asterisk, my Q0, and then forward slash for division, my sample size N. And that's now the piece that sits inside the square root. So you could even, you know, go a step further and say, you know, square root, and this is going to equal SQRT for square root. And then we're taking the square root of that number. So there's the square root of it. And now all I have to do is this thing divided by this thing, right? So up here, I can define this as it equals this cell divided by this cell. And there's my z-stat. Or you could type the whole thing in, in in one fell swoop, right? So if you wanted to, you know, not have to have all these other things, you just have to remember order of operations, that the top is one piece. So if I'm going to do this as order of operations, you know, as one big um, formula, I'm going to do equals, and then I have to do parentheses because i got to get this thing as one thing. So uh, p hat minus p0, parentheses, so that's my top number, that I'm going to divide by the square root, right? I'm dividing by the square root of all that stuff, and that stuff I don't have to worry about parentheses, because it's all, you know, multiplication division, so it's just going to be p0 times q0 divided by n, close the parentheses so it knows that it's taking square root of all that stuff, and then big and there's that same number, 0.859, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, whatever you're comfortable with, do it the long way or do it, you know, in one fell swoop. Now, p-values for one tail. Here's where we can get clever because, remember, your p-value is always um, the amount of area in the tail of your distribution, so in the case of proportions, right, we're living on the z-curve, the normal curve. And I've got one drawn down here. So with the hypothesis test, we're, we're assuming that, you know, we're, we're living in a world on the uh, standard normal curve because we're creating a z-score for it. And we're just finding how far that z-curve um, is moving away from the middle. And remember, on the standard normal curve, the middle is zero. So when you get a z-score that's a positive, it's going to be on the right-hand side. And if you got a z-score that was negative, it'd be over here on the left-hand side. Well, when you're calculating a p-value, it's always asking for the probability of being this far from the center or further. So it's looking for the area beyond your z. So if your z is positive, it's looking for area in the upper tail. And if your z is negative, it's looking for area in the lower tail. Well, the problem is, in Excel, we only have one formula for finding area under a z-curve. And it's the equals norm for normal curve dot distribution. You can see that the first thing it asks for is 
the value that we're comparing it against, and then the mean and the standard deviation. Well, the value we're comparing is our z-score, and we're comparing it to a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, and then we use true for cumulative. That's just how the formula works. Now we put 0 and 1 because you know standard normal, mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. There is also an equal norm dot s dot distribution. And you'll notice this one just asks for z and whether or not it's cumulative. So this function is actually pre-made that the mean and standard deviation are set at 0 and 1. So it's only asking for a z-score. You'll recall that when in ours, it was asking for an x value. Because that one is um, the more versatile function where later on if we want to we could actually just type in an x value and then the mean and standard deviation of our uh, sample and it'll still give us the same idea as if we converted everything to z-score so basically when we're dealing with um, other types of questions we don't have to waste the time of converting things to z-scores but you could use either formula right e either one's going to be fine Okay, so this p-value of 0.8 seems a little bit too large because according to our picture, it should be less than half, right? Because this cuts our, our thing in half and we know that there's an area of one. So if, if we're up here, this has to be less than half because from here up is half and from there down is half. So why are we getting something that's 80% when we wanted just this piece? Well. This function in Excel is a cumulative function, which means it finds the area below the Z you give it. So basically what happened is it gave us all of this, the area below, which is unfortunately the exact opposite of what we want. So we could have typed in one minus that, or we could do in another cell one minus that, and we could get the corresponding area that we're looking for. And then when we have a negative, right, so if all of a sudden on our next um, curve we end up having a negative z, and then we want the area below it, well, when we run that one in our function, it will just give us the answer we want, and we don't have to do 1 minus it. So it becomes kind of a bit of a a pain in the butt that we have to go, okay, do we do one minus this? Do we not do one minus that? And we could set up, you know, like three different uh, kind of p-value calculators here where one does what we would call a left tail test where we just do it normally. One would be a right tail test where it would be one minus it. And then our two tail test would be taking one of them and doubling it, but we don't know which one to take because which one was from our, you know, so it just becomes a nightmare. So instead... Let's be smart. Let's think about this. And then we can use this same concept for every hypothesis test we run. You'll notice that all of them are set up the exact same way with a one tail, two tail option only. Once we figure out what we do here, we can recreate <clears throat> that concept in all of them and then always get the correct p-value. And here's what the idea is. We know that if we have a positive value and it puts us up here, we always have to do one minus it. So all we have to do is make sure that if we do have a, a negative value, we instead evaluate the positive version of it. So what that means is all we have to do is turn this into the 1 minus, right? Because now when we do 1 minus because it's a positive, and now this now gives us the right amount of roughly 20% because now we're back to finding the positive side, right? Because we now have a positive z that is up here and we're looking for this stuff and again the function on its normal basis always gives us below so that's why we did one minus right one minus in our function so that gives us this but then what happens if we have a negative z if we had a negative z it wouldn't work because then we'd be down here. 
the function would give us the tail part that we want, and then one minus it would give us all this stuff up here, which we don't want. So all we have to do is come up here and do ABS for absolute value and put parentheses around that. And now if we redid this test and got a, a negative Z, then we would still get the same answer uh, as being mean we would get the correct answer <clears throat> so that's what kind of makes our life a little easier there and then of course the two-tailed test is always just twice this because the two-tailed test is when the alternative hypothesis is a not equals right we have a one-tailed test if the alternative hypothesis is either less than or greater than and then we have a two-tailed test if it's a not equals and the not equals means we're looking for the area in both tails of the same size. So all we have to do is double this. So it literally just equals this times two. And now we have a functioning calculator that will run every one sample proportion um, hypothesis test that we could ever come across. Okay. Hope that helps.